Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. I'm on stunning Gadigal country here in Sydney. In this Reconciliation Week, I want to pay my respects to the elders of this beautiful country, past and present, and all First Nations people. We thank you for your generosity and encouragement wherever we film the show. This week, from Zenith Kez all the way to Lutruwitha, we have so much coming up. We are in Bendigo. It's famous for its gold rush, historic buildings and its art. But of course, we're here to see the landscape. And there's some really good work being done by teams right across this beautiful country, caring for country, looking after waterways and some of our beautiful native fish. Thanks, Zach. And I'm here at Oz Harvest, a food rescue charity that cooks and packages food for hungry Aussies. Today I'm going to find out how gardening, food and community come together. I've always loved the fiddle leaf fig with its gorgeous rich green leaves. And I'm glad to say it's becoming a more and more popular statement plant in the home. However, beauty comes at a price. It will complain if you don't meet its precise needs. And we head to Mbandwa to learn how plants play a part in keeping the languages of Central Australia strong. Lots of gardeners love working with others, sharing the workload, combining ideas and making lots of cups of tea. I will work for tea. Well, Josh has found a couple of friends who've recently discovered a love of cultivating a little patch of Perth. What did you do during COVID lockdowns? We all responded differently to isolation. In Shoalwater, on the coast just south of Perth, two friends got stuck into a project that is still keeping them busy almost three years later. Did you start with a plan? Um, not really. <laughs> they decided to transform a backyard full of lawn into a productive garden full of edibles and ornamental colour. It was just lawn, green, there's nothing there. It's a pile of sand at the back which we had to get it removed. Describe the gardening conditions that you're working with. Sandy soil, <laughs> a bit of wind, Hush wind during winter from the west. In the beginning, we have to build up the soil and figure out where we can grow things so it's protected from the wind. For Yan Muhammad, a dentist, and Elna Abdul Wahab, completing her PhD in translation studies, their work and uni contact hours stopped at the height of the pandemic. How important was it to have that connection? to a gardening community through social media during the pandemic? It's very important. We meet a lot of online gardening friends, it's, you know, amateur just like us, since that, you know, you can't go anywhere to the nursery and whatnot, ask advice, things like that. We didn't know what to do in the beginning because of the poor soil condition. So when you watch what other people do on the social media, you learn from that. Tell us how you've laid the garden out with plantings and what's the thinking behind it. So I have some vegetables, they're very close to the house for easy access. And then along the path I've got some um, natives, so um, I can see when the bird's coming from my window. Ground level closer to the garden beds and the raised beds, I've got some uh, flowers around them, that's to attract the pollinators. And I've got some fruit trees, I think they're very early in their age, only about three years old. We haven't had any fruit yet, but some of the fruit trees, like the nectarines, are just waking up and got some flowers on them, so I'm hoping we got some fruits this year. And the plants look very healthy. Do you have many pest and disease problems with oh, such a young garden? Yes, and def definitely we got some problem with the tomatoes, slugs and snails, definitely, and the cabbage moth. I don't use any chemical spray at all. Um, I think that's what's uh, good having the uh, flowers because they attract the wasp and the hoverflies, and I think the wasps help um, manage my caterpillars. 
Here, Josh, we have a sad looking Grevillea here. The leaves are yellow and they've got brown spots on them. So what do you think the problem is with this Grevillea? I think it might be phosphorus toxicity. So Grevilleas and other members of the Proteaceae family don't like too much phosphorus. And when they get it, the leaves can yellow off and they can brown off like this. But it's not the end of the world because the new growth is looking pretty good. That phosphorus may have leached out of the sandy soil and the plant's doing OK. And if you look around, some of these other natives are doing fine because not all native species are intolerant of phosphorus. If you do want to feed it, make sure you use a native fertiliser. I like these climbing frames. Did you make these? Yes. Me and Yen, we did it ourselves. It, it's a lot of hard work. We grow lots of snake beans and tomatoes. We train the tomatoes and all the peas. When all the beans and the tomatoes climbing up, it's really gorgeous. It's really green. And we would have like loofahs and cucumbers as well and coming down. Tell us a bit about the raised beds for the vegetables. How have you gone about building up the soil in there? Did you import fresh soil? Because we didn't remove the grass, so what we did was we put uh, newspapers and lots of cardboards to kill them off. And we buy soil and layer it up with uh, compost, um, cow manure, sheep manure, and we also put uh, clays and rock minerals in it. Eleanor, I love how you've kept the bones of the old shed. Yes, Josh. Uh, so this was a 1960s shed. The walls was made of asbestos, so we had to get someone to get rid of it. Our neighbour came in, have a look, and told me that, oh, this is Jara's, you should keep it. So that's exactly what we did. We're trying to recycle and reuse and preserve something from the 1960s. And we just put some braces up just to hold it together. And voila, becomes a place where we have coffee. What would your advice be to others who are just starting their gardening journey? I think start small and have a good intention as well. Because you not just want to grow for yourself. We have been taught that uh, we are not supposed to keep uh, our food in the home for more than three days. So we held on to that belief. Every time we have anything like more that like we can put in the fridge, we always give it away for, for our neighbours and our friends, but especially our elderly neighbours. And that's how we look after them. Hopefully, it creates a gardening community. There really is no substitute for getting out there and just doing it. Sure, mistakes are made and lessons are learned. But along the way, as Elna and Jan have proved, a garden will materialise. It's a spectacular reward that will keep on giving. What are some more interesting greens that you can have in your garden? We grow a lot of broad beans, and while we're waiting for the beans to develop, we really enjoy eating the fresh leaves at the very top. Just pinch them out at the top, and you can add them to your salads, or even better, make a broad bean dip. It's delicious. What's a grow bag? A grow bag is really just a flexible pot. Back in England in the 1970s, grow bags were available and they were custom made. You had holes which you would cut out for drainage and holes which were marked on the bags where you would put in crops. Now, I found them extremely convenient for growing things like tomatoes and gherkins and chilli. And today, you don't need to worry about custom-made ones. You can just get any quality potting mix bag, mark it out and grow it up. And the great advantage of these is if you've got a balcony garden or a patio, you can still grow things really easily. What can I plant that doesn't need deadheading? If you love flowers but haven't got enough time, plant self-cleaning bloomers. Examples include annuals like lobelia, impatiens and begonias, or perennials like diacea, nemesia and bacopa. These plants will put on a show and clean up afterwards. Some may not think that gardening has an impact on the wider landscape, but when it comes to our waterways, 
It certainly can. Millie and Clarence are on their way to check out an incredible collaborative project, restoring the health and habitat of a waterway across an entire city. It's so great you have made it to Bendigo, Clarence, just up the road from my place. And so many of you would have heard of this town. It is a famous regional city. We've got a great art gallery here, these beautiful old buildings. And of course, it's famed for the gold rush, which sort of put the place on the map, but it also turned the landscape upside down. Yeah, and look, like so many places around Australia, those impacts are still felt today. And I'm here in Bendigo with you to meet some amazing people who are doing some great work reconnecting to country and building community. Clarence and Millie, just like to welcome you here today on Dadaburang country. This is my great great grandfather's country. And today we're here at Wanyaram Dam, which is a really sacred area for us in terms of uh, a new way of creating our landscapes moving forward for the future. Jaja Warang and Yorta Yorta man, Trent Nelson, is the chairperson of the Jaja Warang Aboriginal Corporation in central Victoria. He's also part of the Bendigo Creek project. It's a collaboration between traditional owners, the city of Bendigo and other government agencies who are all working together to rejuvenate parts of the damaged waterway. The Bendigo Creek's a lifeblood that runs right through the centre of Bendigo. So for us, it's, it's changed obviously now over you know, 200 plus years. 20 kilometres is actually an urban environment. It's actually a stone waterway that wasn't there when my ancestors managed this country. So there's various impacts that have happened over time, you know, for the Bendigo Creek. It was not just a, a, a long stream that actually connected water from one place to another. It was actually a series of pondages, waterways, and areas where, you know, our people could actually congregate around and it was a life source for us. Here at Wanyuram Delk, which means good water hole in the Jara language, in order to improve the health of the water, ponds have been reintroduced to the landscape to mimic what the 150 kilometre creek once was. Trent, it looks like there's a ton of work that's going on in here. Just, just how much work has been going on? Yeah, look, it's for us really, we've been able to create, um, I guess, a series of ponds, frog ponds that hold water. So they don't just flow water straight through the pond. It runs down through these areas where the rock battering is, so it actually filters the water and creates that sound as, as water's flowing. Yeah, yeah. And there, there's quite a few species I recognise here. What, what have you actually planted in to, to help out? Yeah, so you'll see the spiny-headed mat rushes through here as well, especially the lamandras. Um, kangaroo grass, as you see there, yeah, yeah. as fibre uh, and food for us as a staple diet. But the spiny-headed mat rush really is around um, filtering water and really for us that's the whole idea is actually providing a use for, for also habitat for bird life and species and, and frogs and, and microclimates as well within the round of water. Why is water so important to this story, Trent? Water and what we call gutchins really around, you know, it's our life source. We need water to survive. But for us, our country needs water to survive as well. So any water that's actually been distributed across country, it's our right as Aboriginal people to look after that water and make sure it's healthy for the next neighbours or the, or the country it's going into down the track. Creating healthy water also means creating a healthy ecosystem. This space, before we actually did any work here, it was actually a barren space where there was no sound. So you didn't hear water, you didn't hear gutchin, you didn't hear the frogs, you didn't hear the bird species here. And now after creating this space, we're actually, it's got sound. The landscape's talking again, it's back. You know, it's what our old people were hearing when they were sitting down, you know, making a fire and, and creating ceremony and singing. That landscape was there, it was loud and proud, and that's what you're hearing today. Like you say, we're waking the ancestors and letting them know you were here. Exactly right, mate. Beautiful. <laughs> Right across Bendigo City, the Natural Reserves team from Council are busy creating these freshwater oases. Because 
Around a third of the world's freshwater fish are actually at risk of extinction. And freshwater biodiversity is declining twice as fast as marine environments and those on land. And these ponds are heavily planted to encourage wildlife into the water and they even have floating habitat. And it's to reintroduce fish populations into Bendigo Creek. This is a really important project. Park ranger Rowan Potter has been part of the team for about three years. So what we're doing at the moment is we're taking these sticks that we've taken from off another site and we're putting them here into the waterway to provide habitat for the rare and threatened species that we've got in this area. Because it's not just about putting plants in the ground or the water, is it? It's no, just... no, not at all. It's, a, it's about providing habitat in the water as well. It's about providing habitat for the lizards, for the skinks, for all sorts of critters, uh, even the antichinuses, and, and then you've got the, the animals in the water as well. One of the species that was thought to be locally extinct is now flourishing at this Bendigo dog park. Fish ecologist Peter Rose, who works for the Northern Central Catchment Management Authority, has found these small ponds are the perfect breeding habitat to help build the endangered fish populations both here and at other locations. Wow, that is so many fish. Yeah, they're doing really well here, aren't they? How many went in when you stocked this particular pond? Um, 150 to start with. Right, so there's probably 50 fish in there. Yeah, that's right. So there would be thousands in here now. That is amazing. And so what makes this fish so special? This is the southern pygmy perch, and it's, it's one of our magnificent six wetland specialist fish. And these fish are basically on the brink of extinction in the Murray Corridor. So they're beautiful little fish. They've got a really important function in wetlands where they would have been, both as food for larger fish, but also for water birds. And, you know, they're just beautiful fish in their own right, aren't they? That's pretty exciting to be essentially in the middle of suburbia and we've just pulled a bucket of rare fish out of the water. Why is this site so darn good at breeding fish? There's a few reasons. These fish really thrive when they've got good aquatic plants and good cover. They're real habitat specialist fish and, and we've got that here. There's no pest fish as well. So species like redfin perch, carp, gambusia are real trouble for these species. And the other reason is we've got a good permanent water source. So yeah, it's a really good site. It is amazing. And I imagine that woody habitat also controls where the dogs can access this pond too. They can come in and have a little paddle here, but they can't get to all of the edges and where all that vegetation is. Exactly. So there's access points where the dogs can get in and it means that the vegetation can grow, provide awesome habitat for the fish. And it's just amazing to have a place where you can have, you know, dogs and threatened fish and people and community sort of living in harmony like this. To give these fish a head start, the team had developed simple habitats and the fish love them. We've got ourselves uh, our floating beds and we've got ourselves our aquatic and semi-aquatic plants that we like to associate with these, uh, these beds that we're making. We use them as habitat for animals on top, we use them for habitat for animals underneath and we use them as a great re site to encourage our aquatics. And we're looking at endemic species to the local area? Yes, all of these are endemic to this area here. We've got some uh, Kreshla, we have two different types, the large leaf and uh, small leaf Nardu. We have Myphorum, the milfoil, we have Carrix, and uh, what else have we got in here? We've got some Gardenias in here as well at the moment. It, it, it looks fairly simple, but I'm sure there's a process, and given that you're using PVC pipe, you can make it as big or as small as you like. Yeah, absolutely. It just suits the body of water that you have, so you can make this as small as, as only a two foot or a one and a half feet, up to a couple of metres if you choose to. Yeah, right. But obviously, the bigger that it is, you've got to take into account, you've got to make it more buoyant. So Yeah, the weight might sink it up. That's right, yeah. yeah. You don't want it being the Titanic. <laughs> so this has obviously got to stay on the, yeah, on the so bottom the to stop it. Yeah, so the cloth stays on the bottom, yeah. and then what we do is we just grab some straw there, Yep. Some old straw, break it up and you mix it around the bottom there so it's a nice little layer there. That's good. And just throw in a bit of mulch in there, just a, whatever mulch you've got lying around the house to help speed up that breaking down process. Just mix it all in there. Hey, this is my type of gardening. It's a really simple process. It's the way we like it here. Cool. And then we just uh, throw the top back over that. Yeah. And that's more or less it. Just cables some cable ties around the side of it, like we have over here. Yeah. And then you can plant either directly straight on top of it, or we can plant into the side of it. So yeah. we'll just take one of these uh, sods out here, 
And what we can do with these, these are really, really easy to, to break apart. Just use your hands and you can just tear it as you go. Throw a second one in there. So how, how long have these sods been uh, been growing? Do you... uh, only a couple of months. The plants themselves might be a little bit older, but they've been compiled into these larger sod trays to yeah. help us with these situations. But um, they'll, they'll grow incredibly quick from this point forward now, and they'll just thrive. And for this one here, we can even just sit it below that surface there on that. So that way it just gives it a bit more protection, stop the ducks from pulling them out. That's one of the things, yeah, provide food for some of the birds, but you don't want them eating at all. That's right, that's right, and you don't want them pulling them out and throwing them over the side. Yes. The mulch is a final topping. Mate, that's about it. That's it. Beauty. So we can get this in the water. Why not? Right, right, let's see. Oh, not as heavy as I thought it would be. Millie, it's been so good to be here on Jajawaran Country. I've seen some inspiring projects by some amazing people, bringing back biodiversity and local ecologies. It has been fantastic. It's so true, like all of these projects working independently and together, they feel like little ponds, but when you put them together, they are the lifeblood of our landscape and of course, of our communities. And no matter how small the part you think you're playing, it really does help the big picture. I think that underplanting is an underutilised feature. It's a great way to bring colour and diversity into your garden, enhancing the trees and shrubs that are already there. But there's a key to making it work. There's got to be enough light and space at ground level so the plants will actually grow. This spectacular tree, an Arbutus andracnoides, is perfectly suited to underplanting. It's because there's plenty of space between the ground level and where the canopy starts. While the tree is impressive on its own, the contrasting colour of the bright green underplantings really accentuates the tree's magnificent bronze. These ferns and ground cover bamboo are both easily spreading and grow vigorously in the shade without competing with the tree roots. But beware, the bamboo perhaps spreads a little too easily and here it's kept in check by a solid brick wall. If you're not sure that you have enough room for underplanting, you can create your own room. And that's by raising the canopy of shrubs that would otherwise have their branches growing right down to ground level and trimming those branches off when the plants are young. This large eremophila has been pruned to allow room for this dainty native violet, Viola banksii, to flourish in its shade, adding extra interest, while these straw flowers, or paper daisies, still have enough sun to flower in the front. In any space, clever combinations like these mean more room for plants while building up colour and texture in your garden. Oz Harvest is the biggest supplier of rescued food in Australia and during the last 20 years they've delivered more than 225 million meals to hungry Aussies. It all started back in 2004 when Ronnie Khan came up with the idea of rescuing fresh food that was destined for landfill and she's been making a meal of it ever since. Every day, the iconic yellow Oz Harvest vans set off on their journeys to collect and distribute donated food from their Sydney base here in Alexandria. Ronnie, the sounds of your wearable art precede you. Look at you, <laughs> adorned. It is such a joy to see you here today. <laughs> Look, what motivated you to start Oz Harvest? You know, I saw food waste in my business and one day decided to do something about it, not even imagining that this is what would come out of it. 
Did you realise at that time the scale of waste in Australia? I didn't realise the scale of waste. I didn't realise that food waste feeds climate change. I thought I'd start a social organisation, but very soon I realised it was also an environmental organisation. So Costa, we are wasting in this country 7.6 million tonnes of food a year. And here at Oz Harvest, we are rescuing 250 tonnes a week, which is the equivalent of two blue whales, if you just want to imagine quantity. 7.6 million tonnes of food waste in Australia. How is that figure broken down? So the fascinating thing is a third comes from farmers, a third comes from industry, and a third is because of us in our households. So we have a huge role to play. Now I've been wandering around and there's there's all sorts of materials here. There's stuff on the floor. There's stuff in the pool room. Where's it all coming from? So we collect from everywhere in the food supply chain, from supermarkets, from farmers, from manufacturers. Wherever food is served, produced, we are able to collect it and we deliver that out to over 2,000 charitable organisations. But that's not all that we do. So our education arm is hugely important. We have a program called Feast that goes into primary schools and high schools. And we have a beautiful program that goes out into the community. And that's our cooking for a cause. It's team building. It is to learn about not wasting food. It is to learn cooking skills. Why don't I show you what cooking for a cause is all about? Come yeah, to the kitchen with I'd me. I'd love to see it. I feel my big Greek nose is leading me to the promised land here. Oh, it smells so okay, good. Okay, so this is dignity and respect in a container because I would want to eat this tagine. Isn't it just exquisite? Well done, guys. Yeah. This is going to go out to feed vulnerable people later. And I, they'll get a tiny taste, just a tiny taste. But the bulk of the work that they've done Everything you've learned today is in this dish and going out to feed people. Yeah. But it's Mark's creativity because it is about receiving stuff and then having to turn it into this beautiful produce, you know, this beautiful meal. This is what I like to do, is have people like these in the, in the kitchen on a daily basis, uh, teaching them little kind of tips and tricks about food waste and giving them new skills in the kitchen as well. Lucinda, what have you experienced being part of Cooking for a Cause? Well, I'm amazed that um, all this food was donated for one thing and that we could turn it into such a delicious looking meal. Um, learned some fabulous skills from Chef Mark and I hope our team are really happy with what we've done too and um, the people at the end of the line enjoy the food. And guys, I'd love to know what skills you learned today in this Cooking for a Cause class. Learned how to hold a knife properly. Great. Three fingers, no finger on top. Ah, yes, and how to keep the knife on the board whilst cutting. And how to use every single centimetre, millimetre of every single piece of food that's put in front of us. And my husband's going to learn that skill too when I go home. <laughs> love it. <laughs> love it. So, Costa, you've seen our kitchen. Yeah. Now I want to take you to see our kitchen garden where a lot of the produce comes from. Now you're talking. So what's the story behind this little green space here? It's just divine. I've just noticed a pineapple. Oh. We grow our produce here. We've got a variety of herbs. We've got some rocket. We've got tomatoes. I see some beautiful eggplants. We've got pomegranates growing. And the produce goes into our kitchens and it's completely looked after by volunteers. This is a volunteer project. I'm Ruth. I'm one of the volunteers in the garden. I'm called one of the team leaders because I've had some experience in gardening. Because it's an industrial site, we had to have raised gardens, but it's been a, a case of experimenting with what will grow here, with the limits we have with sunshine, water, and being stuck in the middle of an industrial estate. I'm Edgar. I'm one of the team leaders here at Osharvis Community Garden. We have a range of 
fruit trees that have been around for a number of years. So they produce quite a lot of lemons and limes and figs also uh, around here that we can take into the kitchen. We also try to grow things that have multiple purposes. So like the fennel, for example, we can get the bulb, we can use the fronds and the pollen and even the seeds. So we grow a whole range of things that have multiple purposes. We grow as many herbs as we can because they're not likely to get fresh herbs from the supermarkets or they're past their use by day. So we try to grow things that are unusual and complementary to what they can cook in the kitchen. You can see we've got rosemary, perpetual basil, and we've got a big parsley bed. Looking back now, has it surprised you how Oz Harvester's mushroom to be what it is today? You know, I'm actually in awe of what it has become. My intention was stop food waste, do that for a little bit till I'd solved the problem. I didn't realise the scale of the problem, and I look around and see all of our programs and our masses of volunteers and a staff now of over 300 people. I, I, it blows my mind, but the truth is the need is there, and all we are here to do is service and have the greatest impact we can. And I think if I have one message, it's just every single one of us can play and must play our part. Still to come on Gardening Australia, Jerry introduces us to a tasty Vietnamese herb that can be grown all year round in the subtropics. Tammy has some tips for growing that icon of indoor plants, the fiddle leaf fig. And we head to a school in Mbandwa to learn how knowledge of plants and language are intertwined. A frequent part of many people's lives is moving house, whether for work, family, or other reasons out of their control. And while we can't take away the stress of it all, Sophie has some tips to make sure that some of your garden comes with you. Moving is a part of life for many gardeners. This is my third garden, and there's been some big moves along the way. If you are moving on, you don't have to leave everything behind. You can take some of your plants with you. Today, I'm going to share some tips on how to move with your plants. The simplest way to take your plants with you is by seed. They're like nature's way of transporting plants in miniature. And many plants grow well from seed, particularly annual vegetables and flowers. When you get to your new property, all you need to do is add water. Once you've picked them, you need to let them dry. And then when they're completely dry and brown, store them somewhere. So you can either store them in a jar or a paper packet. Just make sure that you label them and keep them somewhere cool and dry. Sometimes we've got plants growing in the ground that we want to dig up and take with us. I'm going to use this viburnum tinus as an example. It's less than knee height, and at this size, it's likely to transplant really well. Digging plants up can be really stressful to them because it severs roots and it results in moisture loss. And then the plant has to expend a lot of energy to recover. So digging them up correctly is the best way to ensure their survival. Before starting, remove about a third of the foliage to compensate for the root loss. This will also help curb the amount of water the plant is losing through its leaves and make it more likely to survive the transplant. The best time to do this is in autumn, and in my climate, I'd wait till we've had significant autumn rains and the ground is moist enough to be able to dig. It's also a time when there's enough warmth in the soil that the plant's roots will be able to put new growth on in their new environment. Now, if you can't do it in autumn, you can still do it in winter and early spring, but obviously avoid moving plants in the heat of summer when they're gonna stress for moisture. Use a sharp spade and aim to sever the roots in decisive, clean strikes. You may come across larger woody roots. These need to be cut cleanly with secateurs to ensure proper wound response and healing from the plant. Work from the sides, cutting down 90 degrees. And then, when you've encircled the plant to the depth of the spade, try levering it out of the ground. If it's still attached, start to work in sideways underneath the plant to cut the bottom roots off. If you're not going to replant it immediately, pot it on 
and then it will be ready to ship to its new home. Now water is the most important ingredient for a successful transplant. Make sure you water your plant in the pot really well. If it's going to stay in a pot, even be prepared to water it daily. And if you're going to plant it out, make sure you give it a really good deep soak about once a week for the first three months. The plant's had its roots severed, so it's lost its ability to get water for itself. So you've got to baby it until those roots grow back. A word of warning, invasive plants in declared weeds should never be moved from one location to another, as this can help their spread and harm the environment. If your plant's a bit too big to transplant, your next best bet is to take cuttings. That way, the plants that grow will be an exact clone of the parent plant. This is ideal for shrubby plants or perennials. What you want to do is you want to choose wood that's not too soft and not too woody. And then you cut it just below a node. That's where the leaves come out on the stem. You're looking for a piece about the length of your index finger. Remove the lower leaves that would be under the soil level. Now apply hormone gel to the base of the cutting and then pot up into propagation mix. Water well and keep moist over the coming weeks and don't allow it to dry out. Now it's one thing to pot up a handful of cuttings, but what if you've got bigger plants? Say if you want to do a hedge, you'll need a lot of plants and that can be quite expensive. So for bigger numbers, use something called a speedling tray. This is what nurseries use to propagate en masse and you can often find them at recycle yards. This tray holds 100 cuttings. So with these carob cuttings, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to cut just below a node and remove the lower leaf. But I'm also going to reduce the length of the existing leaves so the plant doesn't draw as much water. And then into the rooting gel and into the cell. If you're moving into state, be aware that quarantine rules vary between states. So check your plants against Australia's interstate quarantine website and also your local state's biosecurity authority. Western Australia and Tasmania also have particularly strict rules on the importation of plant material from other states. Pots are inherently portable and that's part of their appeal but they can also be really dangerous because when the pot is full of wet soil with the added weight of your plant, they're really heavy. And lifting pots is the number one cause of injuries to gardeners. So when you're lifting pots, use your back properly and be careful and lift them sensibly. Now, if you've got any really big heavy pots like this concrete planter, you're actually better to lift the plant out and pot it on, empty all the soil out and then move the concrete planter separately. Major pests and diseases have been spread around Australia on plant material and on soil. So check with your local council and your state government to see if your area is home to any invaders and always check your plants for hitchhikers. Once you've got your plants potted and ready to go, you might need to rely on a car to get them there. And this can come with its own set of challenges. Strong winds generated by traveling at speed can shred soft foliage and break branches. If ever you want a demonstration of this, look at a highway near a garden centre on a long weekend. Your best bet if you can't hire a fully enclosed trailer is to hire a box trailer like this one. I'd always pack a trailer or ute tightly so that plants don't slide around and get damaged. And if you've got a plant which is too tall for the cage, simply lie it down and secure the base of it properly using other plants. Using ropes, adhere tarps to all sides of the cage. This will stop wind entering and wreaking havoc on your plants. As always, make sure that your load is properly secured if using a trailer or a ute. Not only so the plants don't slide around and get damaged, but pots which appear heavy can still fly off at great speed. And finally, if you're selling, removing significant plants after the point of sale can actually violate your contract of sale. So better to do your souveniring of plants before your place even hits the market. So there you have it. If you're uprooting your life, there's no reason you can't take a bit of your garden with you. And remember, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. <laughs> 
I'd like to introduce you to a new favourite plant. It's Vietnamese paddy herb, and as the name suggests, it's quite tropical and it enjoys plenty of moisture. The reason I love it is the flavour. It tastes like cumin, and unlike cumin, this can be grown all year round in the subtropics. This plant produces nice succulent stems, so you can eat the stems and the leaves, and there's no wastage. This plant is moisture loving, so it grows in a pot, in a tray, and I top it up with water all the time, so it never runs out of moisture. The best use I find for this is in salads, and of course, Vietnamese fur soups. To propagate, just simply take a section like this, put it into some fresh propagating mix, here I've got some which I put in a couple of weeks ago and in about a month they'll produce new plants with new roots. The one weakness of this plant is that the cuttings can wilt fatally and very quickly after they're taken. So apart from putting them in this box which shelters them and moistening them with water every single day, for the first month I'm using an old archive box I keep them completely enclosed. That builds up the humidity and it prevents them from wilting during the rooting process. This goes into a well-lit position, but out of direct sunshine. And that's it. You can have the flavor of cumin in a warm climate all year round and it tastes delicious. Of all the plant trends of the last decade, one has endured, the mighty fiddle leaf fig. Tammy has some tips for success. I've always loved the fiddle leaf fig, or ficus lorata, and I'm glad to say it's becoming a more and more popular statement plant in the home, with its gorgeous rich green leaves. However, beauty comes at a price. It will complain if you don't meet its precise needs. So if yours is underperforming, don't blame yourself. It's just a bit fussy. Honestly, this plant is just take, take and take. They are tropical plants that love consistent high humidity, moisture and high light levels without being in direct sun. There are a few things to watch out for when growing these beauties. Leaf burn for starters. When the leaves become dry and brown, they're getting too much sun and you'll need to move them away from the window. And if you see mottled red or brown patches forming on the leaves, this is edema, which is caused by inconsistent or too much watering. The plant cells bursting when they don't have enough time to transpire the excess water. An easy way to check soil moisture levels is with your fingers. The top few centimetres need to be completely dry before watering. Alternatively, you could buy a water meter. To avoid water buildup, use a good quality well draining mix and make sure the pot isn't too large for the plant. This prevents water hanging around the roots too long. You'll find that scale or mealy bug will go for unhealthy plants. To avoid this, you want to strike a balance between humidity and good ventilation. If you do get an infestation, then remove with a cloth as soon as you see them. If the fiddle leaf fig is just too fiddly, there are plenty of other large indoor plants to choose from. For instance, the ficus benjamina that can tolerate more light and less tropical conditions. Or the ficus elastica, which is also less fussy. Just make sure it's in a bright spot so it doesn't get leggy. And the ficus longifolia, with its wonderfully graceful droopy leaves, is great for a dark spot. Finally, how about the Fatsia japonica? It is big on leaf statement and tolerates low to bright light. There are several variegated cultivars which are tolerant to changes in humidity. But keep in a pot as it's a weed potential outside. So if you're looking for an impressive standout plant in your home, you need look no further than these big leaf beauties. They're all the trend. Water, or hay in Arunda. Language is powerful. It's as diverse and unique as the culture and country it grows from. Across Australia, over 250 languages were once spoken, and some 150 are still in use today. Join us as we head to Mbandwa, 
to visit a school working hard to keep local languages strong. We are in Alice Springs and I'm from here, I'm born here, grew up here and um, yeah, and we're at the Alice Springs Language Centre. So I started learning Arinda when I was in primary school, all the way through high school. Yep, and now I'm teaching it to the kids. So I teach over maybe like 500 kids a week and um, yeah, it's, it's enjoyable, I love doing it. Yeah. You go. Yana, up Mokule. We are doing a lesson about Dreamtime story, about where I'm from and where my family's from. And we're just talking about um, the animals and yeah, just the storyline for the country out there at um, Tunga. Arumayana, Apinula. Feels great to be sharing my side of the story and my family's side. So, yeah, it's, it's awesome. We are currently sitting at the memorial garden for Miss M, who was my teacher in Arenda. Yeah. She was very inspiring and so friendly and kind. And um, yeah, she inspired me to, to be a teacher. And the garden here was to honour her and um, yeah, just who she was and what she meant to the students. Yeah. Um, yeah, the lady before me was really special. She's been here for a long time, and this was part of her dream to have this um, bush garden now, so that our kids that don't ever get a chance to go at bush, they might learn about bush foods here. They'll know the names, where it grows, when it's ready to eat, what it looks like, yeah. Yeah, so we've got, yeah, lots of native plants here. Bush bananas, bush tomatoes, bush onions, lots of bush medicines growing. So we just want to show the kids in town and be able to feel and touch it and smell it and be a bit different in the book, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name's Megan. I'm in year 11 and I speak Western Arunda. My name is Agnes May and I'm in year 12. I speak Pinjara and Yamkunjara and I've been going to Arunda classes for two years now. You get to learn about the bush foods, cultural stuff and how you learn about language. It's pretty peaceful when I do come here, yeah. This is more hands-on than like the classes we do at our school. There's a damper making process there in that dictionary and it just shows you the types of seeds the old people get. And then we start grinding it on the grinding stones. And then we make um, scones and dampers out of it. Now on on this one it's not just um, seeds that we grind, there's arata. Push medicine. Medicine. There's a procedure for all of this as well, so kids learn all of that. You can boil it up to have a bath in it as well. Antiseptic kind of thing, yeah. Oh, my name is Central Arandanguanelam Arangui. Read me, Gordon. Western Arandaganonoboka, Yelama. I'm going to Central Arandanguanelam Arangui. We're doing two languages here today, so if you're listening, there's different dialects of Arunda that we study. So we've got different speakers that come to the classroom. And we get visitors like Nunga to come and help us as elders, because they still need to um, connect back to them as well, from the classroom back to the community. This bush medicine is really good for scabies and for your open sores. The bush medicine, when you wrap it, the pain goes away. 
and the smell is really nice. Nunaga nang kecil nuna lama kupata, kupata nang nendam nanga yellow eram yetna yellow eram dalam kupata lah laut dalam nampak. Ah nanti tu yellow eram mala ankal nanti yellow. On mera mala tata ke eram. On mandor eram mala water kanang orpol endam eram. Orpol eram mala water kanang Pulih entar nama lalu nang anak kali kan dalam tiem unma. Karena ni nama lakal nang ilku mandam. Sweet entar. Mana mar entar nang ni nang kupat. This yellow one is like raw, like you can't eat it yet. It will fall down to the ground and then you can pick them up and eat them, and it's sweet and soft. And yeah, and these leaves are bush medicine as well. It is important for elders like me to teach the kids so the kids can pass, the, pass it on to uh, their kids and their kids will pass it on to their kids generation to generation. Then they can keep it then. My country is Ndaria. I grew up there. We was lucky at um, Ermansburg with our grandparents, and they teach us a lot. When my grandparents passed away, and I start teaching my kids, I said, English not ours. That's not the first language for us. Our first language was Western Aranda. And then we learned English after. Mm, I done all that one with my kids. And now they're growing up. I got no kid left, only the cats. And the cats looking after me. <laughs> I really like to teach other people's kids, like my niece's kid, Jack. Uh, this is the bush onions. They're like small, and like you'll find them at the creeks. Like if you see this type of grass, that means you know there's a bush onion there, like yalka. Like you can get whatever you want to dig it up with, but like you just do it slowly. So what, what I'm doing right now is peeling off the skins. Now you can see it's white, and that's when you like eat them. It's really nice. Mm, it's good. <laughs> Who's gonna be in now? All right. It's just Black. important okay. to connect to language and culture. I'm proud of what I'm doing and I'm proud that the kids, you know, want to learn also and yeah, they make me proud that when they use it in the classroom. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, one person, one person. <laughs> In cool areas, have chilly nights at your place got you firing up the heater? Move your indoor plants away from heat sources so they don't crisp up from the dry, hot air. In Nipaluna or Hobart, you're enjoying the flowers of local Coria species, with colours from white through red and pink to green. Most species are very hardy, with Coria alba growing naturally on coastal sand dunes there's still time to plant shallots from bulbs. Seek out certified stock from nurseries and plant to 15 centimetre spacings. In warm temperate areas, it's cyclamen time. If you're given one, keep them indoors in good light while flowering and pop them out under your favourite tree once flowering is done. Currently flowering in Nam or Melbourne is the yellow hakea or hakea nodosa. The dense spiky foliage is great protection and habitat for small birds. If the leaves of your taro are going yellow and dying down, it may be time to harvest. 
check the tubers to see if they've pushed slightly out of the soil. But remember, once harvested, they'll only store for about a month. In the subtropics, camellias do best when fertilised, so apply organic manure now and water in. Mianjin or Brisbane is awash with the lacy mauve blossoms of the Melaleuca thymifolia. This small local native shrub is covered in delicate feathery flowers, but is surprisingly adaptable to different areas of the garden. For lemon flavour year round, seek out lemon balm. This flavoursome herb is easy to grow, but can take over. So keep it in a pot to ensure good manners. In the tropics, plant out strawberry runners into well-mulched and fertilised soil, remembering to make allowances for any hungry local blue tongues. Lighting up Garamilla or Darwin at the moment is Banksia dentata, with stunning golden flower spikes. The territory's only Banksia, it tops out at around five metres, so suits smaller gardens perfectly. Melon seed can continue to be planted now. Grow it in a mound of soil to improve drainage and look for smaller varieties for more reliable harvests. Tough, tasty and incredibly nutritious, parsley can be sown from seed now. Flowering in Mbandwa or Alice Springs is Brunonia australis or blue pincushion. This stunning native perennial is all about those electric blue flowers. Give it a shot in a pot to enjoy them up close and personal. Aloe vera is as tough as it is useful and can be easily propagated from pups. Remove at the base with a sharp knife and pot up in free draining mix. Have a great weekend gardening in this beautiful country. If you want to keep up with everything GA, check us out on social media for all the latest. Well, that's all we have time for this week, but I know you'll all keep growing and caring for whatever country you call home. So to put it in Aranda, Kala Mora. We're all done. We've finished well. There's no need to freak out when you hear the word frost, because I've got lots of great ways to protect your plants, to make sure they survive and thrive. How many of you have a space like this? It's cold, it's dark, and it's completely neglected. Well, I'm going to improve the view from the best seat in the house. And we meet a wildflower lover and photographer whose home in WA provides the perfect setting for her work.